Berkeley, KFCF 88.1, Fresno, K248BR 97.5, Santa Cruz, or online at www.kpfa.org. The time is 1 p.m. Stay tuned next for your own health and fitness. Welcome to your own health and fitness. I'm health integrationist Lena Berman. With Jeff Fawcett, Ph.D., we come to you weekly with a critical, independent voice on the politics and practice of health. These are dark times. We are fast moving toward the darkest day of the year, and if you listen to the news, things are generally distressing. We're part of all of nature, and you can use nature as a clue for how you use this cycle. Look around you, and you'll see that the natural world is trending down and preparing for the return of the light by regenerating and resting. As we relish the bright colors of autumn, this display is in service of energy conservation. Gardeners know this. This is the time to cover the planting beds with manure or vetch to let the soil rest and feed on the nitrogen. Why is this so hard for humans? Naturally, this is a time for reflection and inner growth. Resisting this invitation to kick back and recover can have consequences. Going with the flow has great rewards. Today, we explore how to do this. Stay tuned. First, some words from Dr. Jeffrey Fawcett. Thank you, Lena. Feeling helpless is not the same as being helpless. Some time ago, I came across a study in Science Magazine that describes how feeling a lack of control affects the decisions you make. A new study by the same researchers develops these results. Contrary to what you might expect, this research isn't about the stress response, but about the stories you tell yourself to make sense of what's happening to you. When they felt that they had little control, the experiment's subjects tended to have explanations using what the researchers call illusory patterns. Quote, the identification of a coherent and meaningful interrelationship among a set of random or unrelated stimuli. End quote. Conspiracy theories, rituals, and superstitions are some of the common practices these researchers attribute to our need to tell ourselves a story that gives us some feeling of control in situations where we don't think or feel we have any. I pause here to point out three things. First, the whole point of this work is to show how the think part and the feel part are tightly joined, even though they are quite different experiences. The think is cool and is about assessment and calculation. The feel is hot and is about what moves us to take action. Second, these researchers make a profound mistake when they imply that feeling helpless makes people susceptible to irrational explanations. In contrast, I'd say that most conspiracy theories, rituals, and superstitions, in fact, have a rational basis. Otherwise, they'd make no sense at all. In other words, they might seem like lunacy to allegedly normal people, but what normal people believe is not always true. Third, The researchers make a common category mistake by confusing an illusion with a delusion. The researchers want to say that a conspiracy theory is an illusion and therefore false. But an illusion is something like a card trick or a mirage. You think it's one thing when in fact it's another. And in the case of card tricks, it's an intended deception. The whole point is that the illusory explanation seems to be, but is not, supported by the facts. In contrast, a delusion is an explanation that doesn't even seem to be supported by the facts. This, however, doesn't affect the implications we can draw from their results. On the contrary, it adds an important layer to your understanding of what to do when you feel helpless. In the original experiment, the researchers manipulated a variety of situations ranging from an image recognition test to a stock market game. 
Half the people were made to feel they lacked control in the situation and then were tested to find out whether they saw patterns that weren't there. For example, whether they saw images on a computer screen that in fact had nothing but visual noise. In the later experiment, the situations were less mechanical and more social, less about interacting with a machine and more about interacting with other humans. In both experiments, the researchers did indeed find that those made to feel a lack of control were prone to recognize patterns where none existed. The explanation they offer is that what these people were seeing registered in two places, the cognitive brain and the emotional brain. Both areas of the brain look for patterns, and for obvious reasons. The emotional brain registers pat patterns for immediate action. Go to it, get away from it, don't care about it. The cognitive brain registers patterns for thought and evaluation. Looks like a good thing, but on second thought, maybe not. Joseph Ledoux, the author of The Emotional Brain, observes that the emotional brain trumps the cognitive brain. So the emotional brain gets the message that you don't have control. That prompts the cognitive brain to come up with a pattern, explanation, or story that gives the experience structure that in turn gives you a degree of control and thereby reduces the emotional hit of fear and anxiety experienced by the emotional brain. The people who were not set up to feel a lack of control respond in the way that the researchers and by implication sensible people generally would expect. For example, they did not see images in a computer screen. More importantly, when people in the lack of control group were told to envision a situation in which they had a high degree of control, they performed the same as the people in the control group. In other words, a palpable memory of control helps our emotional brain see our current circumstances more clearly and enables our cognitive brain to assess and calculate more clearly. What this tells me is that someone who feels they have little control in a situation is not only prone to seeing things that either aren't there or not the normal or generally accepted understanding of the experience, but also prone to taking actions that might not otherwise make sense to them. I think immediately of common interactions with the medical system designed as they are to remove control from the patient. A little uh, explored area of medical research is the effect of rituals in medical practice. For example, why do you call them Dr. Smith while they call you Dave? Why are they in a uniform and you are in a dressing gown? Much in our social life is designed to limit our control and not surprisingly increase our sense of helplessness and powerlessness. This research suggests that the sense we have of medical, political, and other situations that makes us feel powerless, such as the outcome of the re recently completed elections, will cause us to see patterns that aren't there and divert us away from fighting against the people and systems that work to make us powerless in fact as well as in feeling. The Koch brothers want you to feel powerless. Don't do it. But don't do it by thinking only happy thoughts. Although recalling an empowering experience might help get you on the path to solving problems created by the Cokes or your doctor, what you really need is what will get you in motion. Do things differently, such as addressing your doctor by his or her first name. Better still, do something that will really annoy the Cokes. A transcript of this comment is available at yourownhealthandfitness.org. I'm Jeffrey Fawcett. Take care of yourself. Jeffrey Fawcett is a political economist, writer, and health integrationist who produces this show with me and is primary author of our book, Too Much Medicine, Not Enough Health. Now to today's topic, Dark Times. Um, I'm I'm coming to you today alone to talk about this period that we go through every year. And I must tell you that as we age, despite the fact that people always smile and say you're only as old as you feel, the truth of the matter is that although age has tremendous rewards, it does have a drawback. And the drawback is that we both become more 
intelligent, but we also become more slow. And this means that our capacity for recovery is slower as well. So the price tag on ignoring the natural flow of light and dark and winter and, you know, period for recovery and reflection and all of that stuff, and then countered with spring, which is about growth, although we still have that, we need to pay attention to it even more as we age because we're moving into the winter of our lives where, in fact, there is an importance to recovery, even more so than for young people who can get away with pushing past tiredness and bullying themselves. In either case, whether you're a young person or an old person or a middle-aged person, the lack of light during this time of year has an effect on how well your thyroid functions. So it, it tends to trend down very slightly, not to the point of needing to take more thyroid replacement if you're taking it or that you will suddenly need thyroid it just trends down as an encouragement to rest more to recover more and the adrenal glands and the thyroid have a handshake so if you demand too much from your adrenals your thyroid will also become even lower so basically what I'm saying is if you ignore the message somehow or another Mother Nature will take her payment uh, because if you push through tiredness and you're running as you know that you are at that point on adrenaline and coffee or whatever you use to stimulate yourself, I don't think I want to know, um, that ignoring will tend to cause the adrenal cortex then to put you into a trough, like a recovery trough, because stress and recovery work in peak and valleys and so whether or whether you're you know whether you think you're going to get away with it or not your adrenal cortex is going to make you even more tired if you push through and you run on adrenaline and then your thyroid will work even less well and that will get even lower so the other problem here is that your immune system is also part of this triad so be kind resign and slow down a good thing to remember is that depressive people will have the hardest time during this period because serotonin gets low and some say with it, so goes your impulse control. So what happens then, of course, is that there's an, you just really want to overstimulate yourself. You overstimulate yourself with sugar, with late nights, and you use, as I said, dreadful other stimulants that I don't even want to hear about. This um, this is going to make it very hard to sleep. And so what you can think about doing instead of, I mean, obviously, you've already gotten yourself into that state that young people, children get into where they need to go to bed and they've stayed up a little later than bed and all of their energy is shooting out the top of their head <clears throat> and they're running in circles and getting more and more agitated. This is hyperarousal. We do this too. Adults do this as well. So you stay up too late, you overstimulate yourself, you do all this stuff, then you can't sleep. Um, it's very difficult in these kinds of, of uh, cycles to just just force yourself to make changes. It's very hard to change habits by forcing yourself and bullying yourself. It's the same thing as if you bully that child that's not going to get that child to bed. You have to kind of do some gentle stuff to kind of counterbalance this and forgiving, a lot of forgiving. But you can also add a little melatonin this time of year because melatonin helps a lot with this kind of jet laggy thing that happens when we change the clocks and the time the day becomes shorter and darker. Also, some tryptophan can help because tryptophan helps you produce more serotonin. So in order to maintain that ability to say no to the sugar and the stimulants, having some tryptophan on board, making some uh, serotonin helps as well. And interestingly, vitamin C helps because it helps with both both tryptophan and vitamin C actually help with the synthesis of serotonin and they've been sh shown to work uh, as well as light, light therapy. So before you go running out and or go online and buy yourself a light box, um, you can 
partially get this effect by adding vitamin C and tryptophan. Tryptophan, 500 to 1,000. Tryptophan is the type of amino acid that you can take uh, during the day without getting sleepy. Uh, maybe 500 is enough a couple times. Or you can take 1,000 at night. And it's good to take tryptophan away from a protein meal, like in between meals or after the meal, uh, an hour or more. You also don't want to, likely you might want to, but you might want to not, or you might try to resist eating too late in general, which will interfere with your sleep as well. I'm going to talk a little more about sleep in a bit. So light boxes, you know, nice nice idea buy this light box sit in front of the light box reading a book and you're you're cured you no more seasonal affect none of it it all goes away it's very easy to fix well the problem with these light boxes now is that they're using led lights you're listening to your own health and fitness i'm lena berman i'm doing a show today called dark times the problem with, with light boxes is that they use LED lights, and the new LED lights that are being made now, when they first came out, they were better than the compact fluorescents in terms of emitting fields, radio frequency fields, which uh, also f- make people feel sort of irritable and hyper-aroused. The new LED bulbs and lights, are uh, they've changed the circuitry in them, and they've made them much noisier in terms of both radio frequency and electromagnetic radiation. So they become very buzzy. And for many people, this this sitting in front of a light that's emitting this much uh, in terms of fields is just not an option. But the sun is. The sun works. And honest to gosh, you know, the, the, um, the research shows that sun and also tryptophan and vitamin C work just as well as using a light box. So before you spend the money and increase the amount of fields in your house, go outside. It doesn't have to be when the sun is completely out. Even if there's just light filtering through the clouds during the winter, being outside and moving around in the light is one of the ways to reset your mood and your energy during the winter. So take it when you can get it. Whenever you see it out there, get out there. Even 15 minutes will help you boost your vitamin D sulfate levels, which will boost your immunity and your mood. Obviously, the high time of the day between 12 and 2 is when the sun is strongest, but during the winter, the sun is very gentle anyway. So, you know, at this point, you're not trying to get all of your vitamin D levels up by standing or sitting in the sun during the winter, or, or maybe even better even still is to get some exercise outside. But... Um, you can take uh, vitamin D3 as well orally uh, during the winter. You may need as much as 5,000 IUs. You can test vitamin D levels with a 25-hydroxy vitamin D test, very simple test to take. You want to be at the higher level of the range. So all light during the day is helpful to resist the urge to stay under the covers. Go out and get some exercise outside. Really, it's amazing. Even if it's cloudy out, even if it's sprinkling out, it still helps to have that ambient light. Take a walk. Look for mushrooms. It's a wonderful thing to do outside during the winter. Look for mushrooms. Get yourself a mushroom book, though, and don't be a big shot and just grab something that looks maybe okay. Be very cautious, but even just looking at them is fun and and identifying it. it will improve your mood better than any antidepressant of any kind not the mushrooms just the looking for them but exercise <clears throat> exercise is extraordinary for uh for for counteracting this depressive state that people get in and because exercise actually stimulates your adrenal cortex to make some cortisone, makes some cortisol, cortisone is the artificial version of it, cortisone, it, it actually boosts your energy. And if you get sufficient rest during the day and you sleep okay at night in balance, the exercise will increase your energy overall. Even though you're using energy and even though it's a stressor in its own, uh, it works. And, uh, you know, obviously, maybe not obviously, exercising in an in an amount that that you can recover from easily that helps you sleep instead of interfering with sleep um that kind of exercise which is very individual for everybody everybody has their favorite way to do this 
Uh, some people prefer to do it with other people. Some people prefer to be alone. Some people prefer to do cardiovascular stuff outside. Some people prefer weightlifting. But during the winter, get outside when you can and 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 just let it help you, let it heal you, but recovery afterwards too. I mentioned taking vitamin D, essential unless you live in a sunny year-round place. Now, this is interesting. <clears throat> People who live in Scandinavia, in Scandinavian countries, <clears throat> have less seasonal affect disorder. So, this is a country where it might, you know, for long periods of time, might be dark almost all the time for maybe an hour or something. It gets light, and then it goes through this opposite thing. And my understanding is that when it does get light, people go out in it <laughs> to be there with it. Maybe it's also because of the amount of fish they eat. Um, Omega-3 fatty acids help also for serotonin to pass into the cells. <clears throat> and vitamin C, as I said, adds with the synthesis also of norepinephrine, which is your get-up-and-go catecholamine. That means your stress hormones. So the vitamin C not only helps with serotonin, it helps with norepinephrine. Uh, vitamin C is a bowel tolerance thing, but we've been learning of, over the years doing shows with people who study these things that just taking it two or three times a day, it doesn't have to be a dose that uh, is so strong that if you took a little more, you'd have this kind of explosive bowel thing. Just taking 800 to 1,000 milligrams two or three times a day, depending on your size and your stress level, is probably sufficient, and it doesn't have to be a fancy form of vitamin C. Um, the other thing with vitamins, as I say often, is don't just hunt and peck with vitamins. Don't just take this one because I read something good in that one. Use either get everything, which is, you know, everybody does it different, right? People exercise different. People take vitamins different. Some people, much easier, just take a multivitamin in the morning, add some vitamin C during the day. Or if if you're like me, I prefer to take everything individually because I want to make sure I'm getting uh, a maximal amount of all my micronutrients, all my minerals, and get them in a good balance. But it requires a little more studying up. But a multivitamin and vitamin C, and then you've got your antioxidant powerhouses, especially during the winter, CoQ10, which works on all of your muscles, uh, works on the energy cell, works on the energy powerhouses in all of your muscles, and uh, including your heart. So CoQ10, boy, uh, you know, 100, two or three times a day, 100 milligrams, even more if you need it. And then alpha lipoic acid, a very, very powerful antioxidant, also increases energy, and it supports brain function and energy and both with age and darkness, your brain works more slowly. In case you hadn't noticed, that's why you're attracted to the stimulants. So uh, all the B vitamins also do that and um, various forms of glycine, even just regular old glycine. This is G-L-Y-C-I-N-E. Not This is not lysine. This is glycine, G-L-Y-C-I-N-E. Glycine is an amino acid that has a sweet taste and it balances glutamine. Glutamine is a, not glutamate, glutamine. Glutamine is a uh, very important amino acid for both coating and healing the mucosa of the gut all the way down from the throat and esophagus down. But it also helps to build muscle and it helps with, uh, 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 you know, it's a, it's a good energy one also. But you don't need very much. And when you take it with glycine, interestingly enough, it makes glutathione, which is that powerhouse, another powerhouse. This is your natural. It helps boost your natural uh, detoxification pathways. And glycine, now here's a, a little secret. If you buy glycine in a powder, it's very sweet. It's not sweet like sugar sweet, but it's if if you're not a big sugar person, it will taste sweet to you. And you could take your quarter to half teaspoon of powdered glycine two or three times a day in a cup of tea if you like your tea to be slightly sweet. So if if you if you want, you can use it that way, um, and it will help. But obviously, with everything, 
the right amount is good. You know, there's a sweet spot. And then if you start pushing it in too much, then you probably should think about stevia, which is the only alternative to sugar and fruits, all these, everything that's not supposed to be sugar really is sugar. Any concentrated form of sugar, uh, fruit juice, sweetened, all these um, various uh, um, new agave, and it's, it's all sugar. You know, maple syrup, wonderful stuff, honey. It's all sugar. It's still sugar. Your body is going to respond to it. And um, the only one that won't raise your blood sugars, and there's a reason for not raising your blood sugars, and I'll get to that too, but uh, is going to be stevia if you if you don't mind the taste. And now it's becoming much more palatable. <clears throat> so, as I said earlier, one of the things to keep in mind here is to not exhaust yourself. So, it, and you can do that with exercise too. But the, just the general stress of doing too much and expecting too much of yourself and others—you know, the the traveling, the parties, the shopping, the relatives, too much racing around—and again, you're running on adrenaline. So, that's the hyperarousal. It's really bad for your adrenals. Without good rest, you, you know, you, again, you shoot down into a low cortisol state and then your thyroid doesn't work. So that's just not going to work. You must have rest. Now, when you're under more stress, those are the times when actually eating more protein and fat is important. Fat blunts the glycemic index of the carbohydrates in your diet. And for the sake of your brain... What we have discovered and, and have brought you shows about it is that the most important thing you can do to protect your brain is to keep your blood sugars at an even level. And the best way to do that is to eat a diet that is rich in uh, protein. And again, everybody's different. Everybody's a different size. Everybody does different amounts of work and stress. Um, but the right amount of protein, maybe uh, five ounces of, uh, or something, but it, with every meal, three three times a day, with really good fats. The coconut oil is is really terrific, but there are other forms of saturated fats that don't get damaged by heat. And those fats, you know, using just vegetables, non-starchy vegetables as carbo- as carbohydrate, you don't need the starchy starchy stuff. But the fat. And the protein and the small amount of vegetables and not pushing the fruit and not having a lot of smoothies and not eating sugar and fake sugars will preserve your brain because when there is too much blood sugar around, your insulin levels get high and it actually causes, it's more complex scientifically, but it actually causes your brain to be low in sugar. It actually blunts the sugar getting into the brain and then you can't think and function and over time, takes a long time for this to happen, but over time you're working on a nice case of a dementia in your later years. It's not to be expected that you'd be demented at the end of your life, even though everybody around you seems to do that as they get older. It's not necessary, but a lot of it has to do with your blood sugar. So I know that during the holidays, give other people and yourself, um, but I have to say that from my perspective as an educator, I feel that I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't tell you that you preserve your brain by keeping your blood sugars low, not just normal, but really kind not to the, I mean, if you have really normal blood sugars, obviously you can have some fruit and stuff, but if your blood sugars are over a hundred, you got to watch it. It really is the brain, the mouth to the brain. That's how it works. It's what you eat. It goes, it's going to either protect you, your cognitive function or not. <clears throat> remember that starchy vegetables can raise your blood sugar too high as well and they can cause crashes you know you go up and you down and so think about that now that you can think think about it and make healthy choices don't punish yourself but make healthy choices when it comes to how you eat during the holidays and if you do decide that you must have some kind of dessert remember that you can do things with fruit without adding sugar you can put make a nut crust and you can put some cooked fruit on top of it uh, and make a little tart. It doesn't have to be extra sugary and extra sweet. You can make really lovely food without using sugar and lots of starch. 
So again, forgive yourself, but remember, from your mouth to your brain. <laughs> um, another thing I'm going to want to talk about here is flu vaccines. I'm going to take you, I'm going to say that my take on flu vaccines is, again, this is my take on the research, is that they only work 10% of the time and they often give people the flu. And now it seems they damage the heart muscle by eliciting inflammatory reactions that harm the human heart, the developing fetus, and the um, immune system of infants. So um, they are full of adjuvants and preservatives. Uh, they have foreign animal DNA and cell byproducts, so-called inactive ingredients. But most importantly, they compromise immunological self-tolerance or autoimmunity, the healthy kind of autoimmunity, which is how your immune system teaches itself how to regulate itself through these uh, infections as they come and go. I just want to remind you, you're listening to your own health and fitness. I'm Lena Berman. I'm doing a show today called Dark Times. So we need to take a brief musical break. Um, please stay with us. When we come back, I'll continue this show that I've been doing, and we'll finish talking about what you can do to, to protect yourself during dark times. Stay with us. your own health and fitness. I'm Lena Berman. I'm doing a show alone today that I'm calling Dark Times. Visit our website, yourownhealthandfitness.org, for easier extended access to our over 600 archive shows with our library card feature. You can also find a free stream of this week's show, our book, and lots more at yourownhealthandfitness.org. If you need to reach us, you can email us. It's admin, A-D-M-I-N, at your own health and fitness.org. And it's always all spelled out, including and. So uh, the, the, the thing to think about, again, with the immune system is that um, our immune system is, especially in childhood, our immune system is primed by these little infections that come and go. And... People are becoming very frightened uh, by the media and by the medical establishment about allowing yourself to have these viruses and just support your system instead of trying to eradicate it. And so there's this move toward vaccination. But as I just said, it's looking as though they are very damaging because of uh, the way they're made and the adjuvants and preservatives and foreign DNA and all that. But the other thing is that they're not really designed to stimulate the immune system. If you want to do something to stimulate your immune system, uh, you can use a homeopathic dose uh, called influenzinum. So it's I-N-F-L-U-Z-E-N-Z-I-U-M. Influenzinum. It comes usually in a 9C. And you can take it a few times during the season just to prime your immune system instead of, instead of to, you know, it, it affect or interfere with your natural immunity. Uh, what, what homeopathic remedies in their very, very low dilutions do is they point to something in the immune system response. A vaccine is far more aggressive and not in a, in a microdose like this. 
Now, there are all kinds of herbs that support the immune system. Um, Karen Sanders on KPFA in her archives, you, you might find a show that she did recently about the many herbs and how they work. And another thing which is quite wonderful is how to cook with them because she reminds us that herbs actually are food and uh, people are sometimes look at herbs as if they're drugs and take them as if they're drugs instead of remembering that in the small uh, kind of m organic milieu that they have added to foods and cooked, uh, they can work very well for you. And she goes over all of them, you know, and they can all be cooked. Like even echinacea can be purchased, the root and very, uh, yeah, there's burdock and there's, uh, there's all the uh, sort of ones that you already know about. Uh, but, um, it, I always refer back to her for which, which and how to use them. And they do work quite well. Please don't forget about the amazing immune support of probiotics. Our microbiome is the best protection against these viruses and bacteria. They're the ones that kick out the bad players uh, and keep a good balance. Um, so, obviously, the main thing that I've said so far is follow the light. Don't eat late. Don't overstimulate yourself at the end of the day. And... There's a, very often a problem with sleep. Uh, people have, I found, trouble readjusting themselves during this time of the year and the sleep pattern gets thrown off. <clears throat> if you're having trouble sleeping, also remember that the wireless technologies that are growing exponentially around us, whether we use them or not, are interfering with sleep because they cause hyperarousal. The body goes into a shock response and makes heat shock proteins. Not everybody feels poorly when they're exposed to this, but a lot of people feel sort of wired and can't sleep, and it isn't uh, the best thing to do to your body. Well, some things that can help, it depends on how intractable your sleep is, but GABA, as I've mentioned, an amino acid can be taken at, at bedtime, 1,000 milligrams, and tryptophan again, which is now safe to take if you get a good brand, 1,000 milligrams. Melatonin is very helpful. It doesn't have to be a high dose, 5 milligrams. It depends on your size and who you are. And Melatonin, if it works for you, it, it's what you need. If it makes you feel wired, it's not what you need. And there are a couple other nice sort of uh, flower essences that help. There's something called Rescue Remedy, which is a shock remedy. So it calms you down. There's also one called Rescue Sleep, which kind of stops those looping thoughts that happens. And then for those of us who wake up at, you know, maybe have that three to four o'clock cortisol shift wakes up and whatever it is that you're worried about suddenly just grabs you. Human beings are the only animal that does this, although I can see that other animals worry, but they tend not to do it in the middle of the night like that. Something I, I think is good to remember when that happens, aside from taking some flower essences like if you know what you're afraid of mimulus m u m i m u l u s m i m u l u s bach flower mimulus is for when you know what you're afraid of it helps it just calms you down a little but something i've learned recently after these many years of worrying whatever it is that you're worried about isn't the thing that goes wrong it's always, almost always, maybe not inevitably, almost always it's something else that goes wrong that you didn't even think of. So what I'm saying is there's just no point in worrying. So one thing you can do is say to yourself, look, I can't cover all the bases. I'm doing the best I can. I will be able to deal with this. I can look back and look at my track record and see that I've been able to figure out what to do inevitably, always. So I'm not going to worry about this. I had a great grand, great, great uncle who came over from Belarus. These were Jews that were, not all of them got out after the war. And he was an educated man working in the garment district. And when things went wrong and everybody was getting frightened and flapping around and everything, he would say in Yiddish, very, it's the same as, it's pretty close to German, Haus Pressen. What it means is it will iron out. So you must remember that 
the the best healer for you is yourself the best person to help you when you're in a frightened and hyper aroused hyper hyper aroused state is you because you're the one who knows your pain better than anybody else doesn't mean you shouldn't seek help should seek help if you need it or company to help you but you're the one who knows the pain the best and if you can be there as a witness to yourself that's an incredibly important and wonderful thing so developing a capacity to have a relationship with your symptoms with your fears using meditation using imagery talking to your symptoms my belief is that everybody is a healer not everybody has the degree of sensitivity it takes to heal or particularly to heal other people but everyone has a native capacity to heal and even to help other people but it requires developing sensitivity which happens when you open your heart which is very frightening and accept without judgment your thoughts and feelings even if they are inappropriate now this doesn't mean that if you have inappropriate feelings you're going to go act on them it means that when you witness them and allow them in without without judgment and without being a bully to to all of you you probably don't need to act them out just witness the feeling and receive it and listen and then i i i think when you wake up and you're frightened if you just lay your hands on the part of your body that feels the most afraid and imagine love if you can if you can get to this not everybody can some people need some help with this to get to this that you will find you can warm those parts of you up and calm yourself down and and companion yourself in a way that only you can do um I I'm trying to remember if I meant to go back to anything and um probably you're shouting at me on the other side of the microphone there and I can't hear you but um you know the 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 important message here is recovery no matter what age you are whether you're young or or now getting into your elderly years or even past the capacity is always there the thing that changes is how slowly you recover and increasingly one of the problems for young people is that they're very distracted and that quality of distraction removes you from a state of sensitivity and availability and open-heartedness that will give you clues about how to proceed in the most frightening of circumstances and the world is a, is a tad it's gotten kind of scary um Jeffrey you had said something to me about when things get bad and you're thinking that there's nothing left to do that there is a way to to avoid feeling helpless and I want you to make that recommendation to people well I think this carries on after um the comments I made earlier at the beginning of the show that there's a way in which um having being uh, feeling helpless does not mean that you are helpless and si- simply recognizing that doesn't itself help uh as the experiments that i discussed uh, talk that talk about um being able to overcome that sense of helplessness is a matter of of uh as it were envisioning yourself in control and the best way to be in control is to be active and that activism can take a wide variety of forms um the the simplest the simplest thing is for someone for for you uh any of us to do the thing that attracts us that the thing that is before us that needs being done you may love to go to the garden and do some gardening but if it's a community garden that's a different that's a different animal than puttering in your own backyard 
um, being involved with a food co-op is a political act. Um, so there are lots of things that we can do that draw us, and it's a matter of of telling ourselves literally that we do have power and that we are able to affect change. Of course, many of the things that we think of are the things that Lena has been talking about of of healing ourselves, of maintaining ourselves. What uh, I'm suggesting is that the those instincts go beyond uh, self care and go to the broader issue of caring for others. So Jeffrey is, is talking about uh, staying active and the fact that um, it doesn't matter what you choose to do, uh, this idea that you, you take care of things that you are under your nose. So, you know, whether it's a herd animal or a community garden or helping um, people who need help. Um, that's all political, being engaged that way. And that does help to counter the feeling of helplessness and the depression that goes with uh, the news. There, there are, for some people, though, uh, it's also very important to develop, as I was talking about, this relationship with yourself. And I think that some people don't meditate because they think of it as being something... Um, Eastern and foreign, and you have to learn it. And you, you know, they also have their other misconceptions like uh, that, because it, when you read about it, they say that you should quiet your mind and not attach yourself to your thoughts. But there's almost a trick in there. It's it's uh, when I was taught how to sit zazen, which is uh, Soto Zen meditation in my twenties. You know, they said follow your breathing, count count your breaths, and get to ten and go back. Well, this is a, it's kind of a trick because it's really almost impossible to do this. But what they're but what they're pointing to, at least what I've discovered, and I think I should just let the cat out of the bag because it just feels terrible to say to people, well, just don't think and let go of your thoughts and this and that, is that you take in all of what you have in terms of your thoughts. You take them in without attaching to them. They're kind of happening, but you don't spend the time that you're meditating. And this could be sitting on the corner of your bed. It can be sitting in a chair. It can be lying down, whatever is the most comfortable for you. Don't have to sit cross-legged. Um, but that you, that as I was talking about before, you you notice that you're thinking. You don't use it as an excuse to plan the day or to write your next, next book or, or uh, figure out what you're going to have for supper, but that you notice your thinking and you just go back to the fact that you're breathing and kind of uh, get more expansive. You just That's the idea of attaching, and it's not like you can succeed at this or fail at it. It's observational, and that's what you're developing is a quiet observational sense. Now, um, some tricks that help a lot with this for me, is to listen to the ambient environment. And, you know, when I find myself thinking, I go back to hearing the details around me. It could be as simple as hearing the hum of the refrigerator, or if you're lucky, the wind outside and the birds, or even the sound of cars going by. And maybe what you do is as you're listening, you hear the sound and then you feel yourself let go, and you just kind of keep doing that and then a thought comes in and then you notice oh yeah I'm thinking and you go back to listening and feeling your breath and possibly noticing how your feet feel uh, if they're on the floor or how your body feels and how gravity feels um, uh, acting on your body at that point so meditation I can assure you that as you do it and as you get older one of the benefits of age and also, the quieter the environment electronically is that you're in, the easier it will be to notice that you will have periods of peacefulness. With or without thoughts, you will uh, have the peacefulness, not by uh, trying to attain it, but by um, this benevolent observation uh, that you're developing, which is part of what will save you on a bad night when you're awake at three but you can attain 
I have been able to attain finally after all these years um, this kind of sp- a, a feeling of a tremendous spaciousness and quiet in my mind. I never thought I would. So I can tell tell you that from experience it is possible because if anyone would have trouble doing this, it would be me. And I did. able. I am. So it's it's a practice. It's why it's called the practice of meditation. And some people just start by looking at a color and breathing into the color and just letting letting the it's 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 an open hearted kind of quality and that can cause fear in the early stages of meditation people fr- feel frightened sometimes because you're kind of uh releasing the contraction that we all walk around in the defensive contraction that you're in and the nice thing about meditation is it doesn't have to cost anything and it can be done uh on almost any circumstances um i it's a challenge if you're if you're doing it if you live in poverty and there's noise and it's always a challenge it's not as i said it's always going to be easier in a place that's electronically and physically quieter and more natural so but there are tremendous benefits to it and i do recommend it it's also helpful to do some imagery work i've talked about imagery before it can be as simple as finding you know finding a way to relax whether you say okay now my toes are relaxed and you go up the body ankles and your neck and your head and you go all the way through your body and relax and then you go down a flight of stairs slowly and you end up in a place that you feel really safe in you can make this place up it can be a place you've been uh it can be it can be some place you really are wherever it is that you really feel safe and you can relax and you find a place you notice what it's like in that place you spend some time observing it and feeling it and listening to it get and then when you find a place to rest sitting down somewhere you again observe where you are um concentrate on how you're feeling this is an imagery exercise that that Martin Rossman Dr Martin Rossman uh, teaches and and he has some tapes if you want to buy one uh to do this listening to your symptoms The idea is to set up a dialogue with your symptom and to get a visual for it. It can be light, it can be energy, it can be a person, it can be an animal, it can be anything you don't know, but you just accept it. You observe it. Um and then you notice what it's doing and then you spend some time asking it what it wants. Um asking if you can get some relief. Uh trying it on, becoming the image and looking at yourself and having a full dialogue and then promising to keep the dialogue open. but it's pretty amazing you get some surprises along the way you go what is that how could that be what am i imagining here and then you start dialing uh, uh, dialoguing with it and over time when you do this kind of stuff you develop a more open dialogue with yourself and it makes life more accessible under stress and believe me it's no matter what people tell you life is quite difficult it um I don't know why it's been such a mystery uh these books about how you're supposed to be happy are kind of interesting. Um I I don't think that it's wrong if you do feel happy and you find ways to make yourself happy, but I do think it's important to accept and to love all the states that we're in. Um obviously there are very painful states that we get into and I'm not saying I can love those states. but if you can develop a dialogue with yourself you may begin to love yourself and it may take years and years and years and as i said you may need help but the the degree to which you can have that sense of quietude and dialogue with yourself will ease the hardships of being a human animal in a modernized world or even being an animal in any world um there are challenges and there are things that confuse us and things are not as they seem to us and they're also not as we thought they would be and their disappointments and people feel betrayed close um primary relationships are fraught with this kind of stuff because it takes a long time to get to the point where you recognize that both of you are failures <laughs> in certain ways 
that you're both imperfect and you stop having these unrealistic expectations and you get down to the business of having a big open-hearted relationship with another human being uh just the sound of them in the room can be a tremendous comfort to you uh, the capacity to share experiences but if you choose to be alone you will always have this person with you that knows you and knows your pain better than anybody in the world can know and you need you need to keep that open obviously animal companions help but the whole world as far as i'm concerned is an animal companion since i don't increasingly i don't see a separation between us and everything else in nature i see us as an intrinsic part and a and a part of a bigger whole it's just truly how i feel like it or not there are aspects to it that break our hearts but we are part of it and we're not a distinct separate thing as far as i can tell but we certainly have a lonely experience of being alive which uh it, somebody once in a poem said requires a 4am kind of courage and i think everybody knows about that during dark times during the winter when your uh body uh, gives itself up to a cold or a flu that terrible sad feeling that you get is part of your body asking you to lay down and rest and read a good book or watch some comedy and give in because it's your cytokines your killer cells trying to take care of you your immune system knows what to do obviously if you've got a high fever you might have to take some something like a, maybe one baby aspirin or get in you know put a baby in a coal in a kid in a cold bathtub to cool them down but for the most part the body kind of knows what to do and um there there should be this kind of trusting loving quality to our approach to our health and that's what i'm advocating during the dark winter months when all of nature is asking you to take a break to recover to be reflective and to get ready for the spring which is energetic and full of growth and new ideas but this is the time of year when we have to kind of come to grips with the stuff that's been going on that we haven't had time to think about this is the time to take care of that that's the time to cover the fields with manure or some other nitrogen source and breathe and uh and care have a care as they say so um with that uh i hope that you will be kind to each other and to yourselves above all compassion starts at home and you can't help anybody else unless you can begin to feel that sense of love and compassion for yourself first i think we all know that but it's hard to practice i know it's hard to practice so that's all i have to say about dark times i hope that this was helpful um i look forward to the spring as you do but i'm also enjoying at the end of the day walking outside and having a look at the sky as it changes that's what life is about it's full of that quality of change that's the story change nothing stays the same except for that quality of change and it's slippery and it's hard to open up to but it means that you get a break it means you're not at fault when things go wrong sometimes you're doing the best you can and it just didn't work and you just go on to the next moment I want to thank you all for listening. I'm Lena Berman. Visit our website yourownhealthandfitness.org for easier extended access to our over 600 archive shows with our library card feature. Find a free stream of this week's show, our book and lots more at yourownhealthandfitness.org. If you'd like to reach us, email us at admin a d m i n at yourownhealthandfitness.org. Your own health and fitness is produced by Lena Berman and Dr. Jeffrey Fawcett. Remember being informed not only protects your health, it protects your freedom. You're invited to join our team for the KPFA Winter Crafts Fair. We are seeking friendly and reliable volunteers to help at the doors and to assist exhibitors and visitors at the fair. On Friday, December 18th, we welcome assistance in setting up from 11 a.m. to 6 p.m. 
on Saturday, December 19th, we need help from 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. And on Sunday, December 20th, from 10 a.m. to 8 p.m. This event takes place at the Craneway Pavilion in Richmond, and it's a great opportunity for you to attend as KPFA's guest in thanks for working a three-hour shift at the fair. If you'd like to sign up for a shift, call Felix at 510-848-6767, extension 629. Or email volunteer at kpfa.org. As always, we appreciate your help and and hope hope to to see see you there. there. Here's another community-powered announcement from KPFA. You are invited to enjoy We Shop, popular dance troupe, on Saturday, November 14th at 7 p.m. at the Norse Theater in San Francisco. We Shop, popular dance troupe, was created by Palestinian students who celebrate their heritage and believe in the arts as an effective communication tool. They have performed in Algeria, Egypt, Lebanon, and Spain. They are traveling from Palestine to perform here. This is a benefit for the Arab Resource and Organizing Center to assist with relief work in Gaza. This event takes place at the Norse Theater at 275 Hay Street in San Francisco. This event is wheelchair accessible. For more information, please call 